This lecture will focus on infectious diseases of the skin, nervous system, cardiovascular system, and lymphatic system. So we'll start by talking about infections of the skin. These include acne, gas gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis, Hansen's disease, chickenpox, measles, and rubella. So to begin, acne. Acne is most commonly caused by the bacterium Propranobacterium acnes. It's normal skin microbiota, so this is normal skin bacteria that lives all over the sur surface of your skin. What happens is if they get into a hair follicle, they can start to consume the oil inside of the hair follicle, which most of you may be familiar with how a pimple is formed. If that hair follicle and its surrounding sebaceous gland get infected, and if the person produces certain hormones that kind of promote the development of an environment that supports the growth of these microorganisms, then what would happen is a pimple forms. So in normal circumstances, the sebaceous gland is a holocrine gland. So what that means is that the cells inside of the sebaceous gland are going to grow and grow and grow and eventually rupture. And when they rupture, the oil is secreted on the surface of the skin and in the shaft of the hair to kind of moisturize everything. In the case of a pimple, that bacteria kind of prevents that rupturing from happening. So the bacteria fester inside of there and then it can cause um, an infiltration of neutrophils to the area which lead to the development of pus. There's also pimples that are open, so the pores actually open to the outside environment. That's what forms a blackhead. And a blackhead isn't black because it's dirty, it's black because of the oxidation of the um, waste products of the bacteria. So when oxygen mixes with those waste products, it forms a black precipitate. So if on the exam I'm talking about a pimple, you are going to be selecting from a multiple choice question the causative agent of that pimple. You're going to look for the word acne right there in the name of the um, microorganism that causes it. These are treated with topical antibiotics. In very severe cases, they're treated with oral antibiotics, such as doxycycline. Gas gangrene. So there's three major types of gas gangrene. One of them is caused by Clostridium perfringens. Another one is caused by strep. And another one is kind of a mixed infection. But we're going to focus on the one that's caused by Clostridium perfringens. So Clostridium perfringens is a strict anaerobic microorganism. So it thrives in anaerobic environments and it can die in the presence of oxygen. So because of this, this one prefers to create an anoxic environment around it. The spores of Clostridium perfringens enter into a wound and usually when they enter into the wound it's going to be deep inside of a wound. Once they're inside, if the tissues kind of close around it, then these microorganisms are going to hatch out of those spores and they're going to start to replicate producing the toxins that cause the tissue death. So here you can see the puncture wound was likely somewhere in the ankle here and the toxin has caught, have spread through the underlying layers of the skin and caused necrosis or death of all of this area. In order to treat this, you would have to do either wide surgical debridement. So debridement means that you open up the tissue and scrape away all of the necrotic tissue. But because this toxin is now going to be in the bloodstream, the safest thing for the patient would be to amputate. And you wouldn't just amputate at the edge where you see the black and the living tissue. You would have to amputate the entire leg. Reason being is that you want to prevent the spread of this toxin to vital organs in the body. Symptoms of this, pain, edema, lesion, fever, tachycardia, so that's an increase in heart rate, blackened tissue, and when you push on it, gas bubbles come out of the wound opening. I posted a video clip about a patient that actually has necrotizing fascia, um, sorry, the gas gangrene. And the doctor refers to it as a necrotizing infection, and even at one point calls it cellulitis, but what the video is actually showing is a gas gangrene. It's showing the blackened tissue, and then when you push on it, the gas bubbles come out of the wound. Now, in cases of necrotizing fasciitis, I'll talk about that one next, but the tissue usually opens up, so you see like wide opening of the tissue. In the case of cellulitis, it's closed, just like you have here, but in cellulitis, it's usually just a reddening 
underneath the layers, uh, the inside of the connective layers of the um, underlying skin tissue. But in the case of gas gangrene, you actually see it turn necrotic and die, and this stuff ain't coming back to life. So this is a very serious infection. Prevention is key, so any type of wound infection should be flushed out, preferably with hydrogen peroxide. If you remember the role of hydrogen peroxide in killing anaerobic bacteria, you can refer back to my discussion on the catalase test. You're going to remove the tissue around the wound, provide antibiotics to the patient, and treat them with a hyperbaric chamber. A hyperbaric chamber is pressurized oxygen. So if this bacterium dies in the presence of oxygen, and you force extra oxygen into the patient's tissue, you could kill the bacterium with just oxygen. So that's a great way to help treat this infection. As a matter of fact, after patients have major surgeries, a lot of times they will receive hyperbaric treatments, and that's to force oxygen into the areas, not only for energy production, which aids in healing, but also to prevent the formation of this type of infection. So to kill off those really bad anaerobic bacteria that are going to try to um, destroy the tissue. If this first round of treatment fails and the infection progresses, then amputation or debridement would be the next route. This is a picture of necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is caused by certain strains of Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes. So not all Staph and Strep species or strains out there cause this. It's just certain strains. And people happen to carry these strains on the surface of their bodies. And then when they get even something as small as a paper cut, the bacteria get into the wrong area at the wrong time and happen to have some mechanism of evading the immune system. And they can start to produce these enzymes called collagenases that eat through collagen, which is in the underlying layers of the skin. And they basically open up the skin. Something that started as a little tiny paper cut or puncture wound here can rapidly spread to open up the entire arm in a matter of hours. So this is huge. It's known as the flesh-eating bacteria, and they call it flesh-eating just because of the presence of those enzymes that destroy tissue. Rattlesnake venom also contains collagenases, similar to what these guys are going to pump out. So when you have a rattlesnake bite, for example, similar types of things happen. You have sloughing off of tissues. The infection spreads in the connective tissue. The overlying tissue dies. Surgical debridement is necessary. So open it up, scrape all of the um, necrotic-looking tissue out, and try to clean it out as best you can. Put the patient on some very strong IV antibiotics and then hopefully you can stop the progression of this infection. Patients can have necrotizing fasciitis in any part of their body. And if you Google this and look at Google images, there are some pretty disturbing images out there about this. But um, necrotizing fasciitis, again, that's going to open up. These are um, aerotolerant, which means they can tolerate oxygen, and um, facultative anaerobes. So these can live with or without oxygen. So these guys don't care if oxygen's around. They're going to open up the tissue and that's what it ends up looking like. Hansen's disease. So Hansen's disease is the new name for leprosy. Leprosy has a lot of negative connotations, particularly in certain religious groups. So if you um, are of a religious background or have any religious education in your background, you may have heard of like leper colonies from back in the day. And I'll talk a little bit about why they were put in these colonies. If you don't have any background in this and you've never heard of this before, um, leprosy is a disease that causes disfigurement and nervous system damage. The disfigurement is often found in the colder regions of the body, so the tips of the fingers, the tips of the toes, the tip of the nose, and the tips of the ears. Because this microorganism likes to replicate inside of macrophages that are found in those areas. When it infects those areas, it causes disfigurement in those areas, and people used to believe that they were demons because the disfigurement made them look different. So they would throw all of these quote-unquote demonic-like people into these horrible conditions and beat them and basically kill them off and shun them from communities. Really, that did no good. 
Leprosy is not known to be transmitted directly from person to person. So it's not like by isolating them from the public, they were even like helping other people from getting it. That's not the case at all. We still don't know how this is transmitted. We do know that about 95% of the world's population is innately immune to getting this. So even if you were to come in contact with leprosy directly, it's unlikely that you're going to develop an infection. Only 5% of the population is susceptible to being infected by this microorganism. Now the microorganism that causes this is Mycobacterium leprae. There's also another one, Mycobacterium lep um, uh, forgot the other name, but there's another organism that causes this. This one is much more common. Plus, if you think of Hansen's disease, leprosy, leprae is right here in the word. It kind of looks like leprosy, so that's a way to remember it for the exam. The reason why I have a picture of an armadillo up here. So when I did my master's degree, I did that in Texas, and I met a guy down there and moved in with him on his ranch, and his ranch was 40 acres in the middle of nowhere. Like literally, it was a 20 minute drive just to get to a gas station. So it was an isolated farm property. They had cattle out there and everything else. There was a, a lot of wildlife out there, including armadillos. And armadillos are essentially blind. So if you don't move, they don't see you. So they'll walk right up to you and you can like reach down and pick them up and hold them and stuff. So I was out one day looking at the different wildlife and I saw an armadillo. So I stood really still and the armadillo started walking toward me and I bent over to pick up the armadillo because I've seen people do this all the time. And the guy I was with basically tackled me <laughs> and said, no, 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 you're gonna get leprosy. So that was weird. Uh, I was like, what, I'm gonna get leprosy from a, an armadillo? So of course I had to go Google it and uh, turns out yes, they naturally carry leprosy. So they carry Mycobacterium leprae. It's not 100% known if they can transmit that leprosy to people or not, but they carry it. So um, down in Texas, I guess they caution people to not touch armadillos. So that's a random fact of the day. So there's three different forms of the disease that exist. One of them causes shallow skin lesions and dermal nerve death. Another one causes disfigurement and another one causes nerve death and muscular degeneration. This can easily be treated with drugs. The drugs take a really long time because mycobacterium takes a really long time to replicate. So just like mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium leprae replicates very slowly and it grows in the colder macrophages. So that even causes them to grow even more slowly. So in order to get adequate antibiotic delivery, you need to have a long-term use of the antibiotic, but easily treated with antibiotics and relatively good prognosis. Even without treatment, uh, the worst that's gonna happen is they're gonna have some muscular degeneration due to the nerve death, which can cause a little bit of pain, but a lot of times people make full recoveries from leprosy. Chickenpox, so the varicella virus. So chickenpox is caused by the varicella zoster virus, which is a human herpes virus type three. Transmission is direct contact or droplet contact. The virus may become latent in the spinal ganglia. So when you get infected, this starts to infect the um, layers, underlying layers of the skin. So deep where the layers of the skin are still replicating in the stratum basale. From here, they're going to cause these lesions that form that look like blisters. It becomes really itchy. So when you start scratching it, you're actually spreading the virus to nearby areas. And that's how it spreads so quickly. Every time you scratch, you're spreading it to other parts of the body. After the initial skin infection, so that will go away within a couple days. And then complete recovery is within a couple weeks of the flu-like symptoms and so forth. Then the virus, goes inside of the spinal ganglia of your nervous system. So if you have, if you think about your spinal cord, all of these nerves branch out of your spinal cord to go to your arms and your legs and other parts of the body. Right where those nerves emerge from the spinal cord, from the dorsal region of the spinal cord, that's known as the spinal ganglia. So that's a collection of cell bodies of neurons. The virus hides out in there. 
And in some cases, later on in life, that can emerge as shingles. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But there is a vaccine now for chicken pox. When I was little, we didn't have a vaccine. So I got chicken pox when I was little. I also had febrile seizures. So when I had chicken pox, it elevated my body temperature which actually gave me a seizure and put me in a coma for two days. So I was completely unconscious for two days and very, very, very sick when I got chicken pox. But everyone wanted to bring their kids around me because if you get chicken pox as a child, it's a much milder infection than if you got it when you were an adult for the first time. I remember my dad couldn't come into the room by me because he had never had chicken pox before and I was really sad because I was such a daddy's girl back in the day. Um, but now there's this vaccine, so you don't have to intentionally expose your children to the active uh, virus. So symptoms, I kind of talked about those symptoms. You have the eruption of these lesions on the surface of the skin that are really itchy and they break open forming a yellow crust. And if you scratch them and open them up, then that will emerge and infect neighboring cells. So shingles, so here's that picture that I kind of um, talked about with the spinal cord and the nerves that branch out of the spinal cord. So the muscles are over here, but you can imagine the spinal cord right down the back here, and then you have all these spinal nerves that emerge. And the spinal nerves, there's going to be um, mixed nerves that come out of here, mixed meaning that they carry both sensory and motor information. So one of the fibers is gonna go up toward the surface of the skin, and that carries the sensory information to the central nervous system. Another one of the fibers is going to go to the muscles which provides motor function to those muscles. And the regions that are served by each one of these spinal nerves coming out here are known as dermatomes. So a dermatome is a region of skin that is innervated by the branches of one spinal nerve. So each one of these stripes is innervated by one spinal nerve. So if you look at C7 here, C7 serves this stripe of skin here. So if you look at this patient with the shingles outbreak, you can see that it's this very distinct stripe that's affected. And this is extremely painful. I hear it's one of the worst pains that you can ever imagine. But this likely is the virus hiding inside of the spinal ganglia of C8 and going down the arm. And you can have, usually it's just on one side of the body, you're not going to have it on both sides of the body, and usually it's just in one dermatome, unless you get multiple infections in multiple spinal ganglia. And there's different triggers that people know that if they do this, it's going to trigger their shingles outbreak, and some outbreaks are completely random. The stimulus varies per person, but usually a person with shingles ends up catching on to what um, caused their outbreak of shingles. Acyclovir is the treatment and it's effective if it's started early. So right away when you start to show symptoms, if you start taking acyclovir, which is an antiviral, it has shown to be successful. So getting vaccinated versus getting the actual varicella virus and your chances of getting shingles. So I've asked this question a lot in classes and I've got a lot of questions around this. Some people wanna know if you've never had chicken pox in your life, can you get shingles? Yes, you can. And the reason being is just because you don't have an active infection of chicken pox, just because you don't display the actual like pustules on the surface of the skin, doesn't mean that the chicken pox, the varicella virus, never entered into your body. Maybe the virus entered in and got its way into your spinal ganglia without ever showing actual signs of the initial infection. Later on in life, that can outbreak as shingles. I've also gotten questions, well, I've been vaccinated against the varicella virus, so can I get shingles? And the answer is again, yes. So it is possible that either the memory cells from that initial vaccine go away, or that even in the presence of that, you have the virus getting into your spinal ganglia. Now you don't have the active infection or the initial signs of a chicken pox infection, but it can emerge later on in life with shingles. So no matter what, you can end up with shingles whether you had it or not. Um, it's more likely that you're going to get shingles if you've had an active chickenpox infection though, much more likely. But it is possible to do it without ever having that initial infection. 
measles. So measles is caused by the rubola virus, so you should memorize rubola with measles. This is highly communicable, which means it's spread readily from person to person in communities. One of the signs of measles is coplic spots, so they're these large spots that initially appear on the neck, and then it spreads to the torso and the rest, or the rest of the body, and then they get these deep lesions, or these broken open like sores inside of their throat, and those broken open sores are really painful and they can cause um, a little bit of bleeding in the area. From there, from the sore throat, cough, and headache, and the oral lesions, it can progress to serious permanent neurological damage leading to coma and death in some cases. With kids, usually children cannot get this, so you first become infective or um, have, gain the ability to become infected with measles when you're about two years of age. And by then, you definitely received MMR vaccine and boosters and so forth, so you have that initial protection. And the MMR vaccine is extremely effective in preventing measles. Unfortunately, due to this huge anti-vaxxer movement, the um, herd immunity for measles has greatly decreased and there's been a lot more reported measles cases. Hopefully you watch that video that I posted on measles. It's very informative and gives you a little bit of insight on the measles outbreak. Rubella. So the MMR vaccine covers measles, mumps, and rubella. We're going to talk about mumps in next week's lecture when we go through the digestive system diseases. But out of the three, rubella is probably the mildest. Rubella is also known as German measles, although I will never call it German measles because that's just too confusing on an exam. So just know rubella is caused by the rubella virus. You get a rash and it goes away. Very few complications, unless you're pregnant. If you're pregnant, Congenital means during pregnancy infection. There is transmission of the virus to the fetus in utero. The mother can transmit the virus even if she is asymptomatic. If the baby gets this, it causes deafness, cardiac abnormalities, ocular lesions, mental retardation, and could lead up to miscarriage. If it is a term pregnancy and the baby manages to be delivered, the baby is going to have very serious and lifelong disabilities due to this infection. So mothers should make sure that they're current on their vaccinations before they get pregnant. This one they do not recommend during pregnancy, so they will not typically give the MMR vaccine during pregnancy, which is why it's important that before you decide to have children, just make sure you're current on all of your vaccines.